and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Enhancing Data Insights, the Linux Foundation's Semantic Layer of Success, sponsored today by Cube. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just a note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce you our, introduce to you our speakers for today, Jen Grant and Rudy Gregar. Rudy is the Director of Cloud Services and Development Operations at the Linux Foundation, adept at driving strategic initiatives and fostering technical, uh, technol technological, excuse me, Excellence. Now I'm going to get tongue tied. Proven expertise in leading cross functional teams, optimizing IT infrastructure, and implementing innovative solutions to fuel organizational growth. Passionate about open source technologies and dedicated to empowering communities through collaboration. Jen is a COO at Cube and has spent at least 15 years building companies from the ground up and taking multiple companies to over a billion dollar valuation. Former CEO of Appify plus a CMO hat trick with Box, uh, Elastic, and Looker. Jen now sits on the board of Dialpad, Pecan, and uh, Kindy, as well as advising Appify, Stitch, Waitlist.me, and Postal.io. Recently, Jen was recognized as one of the top 100 Princeton technology leaders in 2021, as well as a woman of influence in Silicon Valley from the SVBJ. And with that, I'll give the floor to Jen to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. So nice to be here. And uh, I know Rudy and I are really excited to you know, talk about semantic layers, talk about what the Linux Foundation did. I think um, I really do, let's see, this is, let me give you a sense of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to share just a little bit about Cube, about semantic layers, just to give us all the same sort of baseline. But really, we're going to spend the majority of time uh, talking about what the Linux Foundation has done, uh, how they think about their data stack, some of the choices they've made. And it's really, these are most fun if we get lots of questions. So um, as you think of a question, go ahead and, and type it into the q and I am watching them. So um, we will, if we, if we can fit them into the conversation, we will. We certainly will have time at the end, uh, but it is definitely more fun if this is a discussion and we can zero in on what everyone's thinking about as we, as we go through this. So super excited to get started. So I'm just gonna dive in a little bit. Uh, and you know, talk about the semantic layer. So we at Cube, obviously, and throughout much of my career in various companies in the data space, uh, think a lot about kind of the the problems that you know the data community is dealing with. And I think what's really interesting is that we used to always talk about the demand for data continues to grow, and we would talk about how employees want it want data and they want it in you know different formats, dashboards, apps, however, uh, you know, however they want it, they want it. And then, of course, we we offer data to customers uh, because we have either within the product we have analytics. Uh, or there may even be partners or customers that want analytics about how they're, you know, the work that they're doing with us. What's new is the machines. So OpenAI, all of the AI tools, whether it's a chatbot or an AI agent or something to that effect, the machines need data as well. Uh, so we've sort of expanded and then expanded even more, uh, and we have a new customer that we need to serve. Uh, and so many of you, you know, if you're from the data community, these things sound familiar. And my hope is that you're all going, oh my gosh, yes, this is definitely what makes this job hard. And it is the complexity of our world it is the, the complexity of the data stack has only increased over time. So we have, you know, not only do we have multiple data, uh, cloud data warehouses, but we also have all sorts of stuff in the in the middle layer, as well as a bazillion visualization tools that uh, people have the choice to use. So stitching together all of those technologies becomes more and more and more of the job of owning and 
uh, taking care of your data stack. And then, of course, uh, all sorts of you know analysts have talked about the, the proliferation of siloed data. So we have thousands of SaaS apps. They're all storing data. We now have these AI agents. Uh, we have data in Slack. We have data in our marketing tools, uh, in our sales tools. We have data everywhere. Uh, so these silos creates this disconnected experience, which means it's very difficult for people to actually get value out of the data. And then finally, um, where it really gets into kind of the business logic is that, you know, that that dream that we all have of the single source of truth. Um, and we haven't really achieved that. So we have business logic. We have basically data models in every single one of these uh, different tools that we use. So in Tableau, we have many data models in each workbook, uh, for example. Then maybe we have Looker and we have our data model there. We have all of the other visualization tools. If we've built something within a product and we've embedded analytics, there's a data model in there. Uh, there's a little bit of data model in almost everything we have. So it, it is it can be very difficult to have a single source of truth. And we sort of suffer from this inconsistent business definitions. And I always like to talk about, well, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that your business users walk into a meeting and the salesperson says, we made the number, but only because sales was amazing. And the marketing person walks in the room and says, we met our goals, but sales was not amazing. And then they both look at different data that they've pulled from their different siloed complex systems. And instead of focusing on how do we move the business forward and do the right thing, they focus on the data brawl or whose data is right. Uh, and that doesn't serve anyone. We all want to be successful as businesses and we want to support our business users. And in order to do that, we need that single source of truth. So where does that come down to? I think where, where it ends up is that we believe that the universal semantic layer is a critical component that all new data architectures and strategies need to use, need to be thinking about, that this actually takes the, uh, the data stack to the next level so that you can develop that single source of truth. You can develop uh, that, that center layer that brings together all of your data sources and then delivers to as many visualization tools as your as the demanding folks, both the robots and the humans are asking for. So that kind of gets down to, to Cube Cloud. So, so what is Cube Cloud? We believe model once deliver anywhere that this single source of truth, this uh, Cube's universal semantic layer really solves a lot of the complexity that I was just talking about. So when we talk about like, what do we really do? We unify your company around that single source of truth, delivering consistent metrics, definitions of data, all of the things that, that need, the business needs to have uh, a consistent view of and that everyone needs to have access to, to do the analysis that they need to do. We also do, uh, the second pillar of Cube is govern. So we centralize your data access controls. So instead of having, you know, five different data sources and, you know, 15 different visualization layers, they all have different places where you update the, the security and the data access that each and every one of the employees that access this data have. You can centralize all that work into one place. And while you know the data engineers and the data analysts and the admins that do this work find it very, very useful, it is also more secure to do it this way. There is very little uh, opportunity to make errors. Uh, it is, you know, it's something that you can see and enforce in one place, which makes it more secure than if it's sprinkled all over your organization and uh, and there's a high likelihood of mistakes. And then finally, uh, Cube is all about optimizing. So um, all of the tools of Cube come together to allow for you in, you know, every place that you have data, you can look through, okay, which queries are the can we make faster, which are having issues uh, that we have all the diagnostics and the performance insights. You can look at the query life cycle. You can see, you know, what queries are happening all the time that you can then potentially pre-aggregate. So you don't need to hit your snowflake 
database as many times uh, as people are asking that particular question. So there's a lot of optimization we can do in there to make things faster, uh, more cost effective, and just generally easier for a data engineer to sort of manage this central single source of truth. Okay, so that's enough from me. That's enough about Cube. Um, it is my pleasure to, to uh, chit chat with Rudy. I'm gonna let him you know, just tell you whatever he feels like telling you about what Linux has done, what Linux focuses on, and then I'll start asking him questions. So as as we dig into Rudy and uh, you know the Linux data stack and what they have have built, uh, please let the questions flow in. I'll be able to read them and and integrate them into our conversation. So with that, I am going to hand it off to Rudy. All right, thank you, Jen. Uh... So as we already talked about, I, I manage the cloud engineering team here at the uh, Linux Foundation, and we've been using Cube Cloud uh, for the past year or so to build out tooling um, for our open source projects at the Linux Foundation. So uh, a little background on the Linux Foundation. Yeah, we're a, we're a nonprofit uh, funded by members uh, with over 900 open source projects as part of our uh, portfolio of projects. And we do a little bit of everything. We're we're, you know, running events for our projects, uh, uh, large events like KubeCon, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, conference, uh, as well as the Open Source Summit, uh, which just took place a couple weeks ago, and uh, uh, smaller meetups and and things for uh, for smaller projects and and kind of like developer day type events. Uh, we have trainings and certifications. Uh, we do legal uh, sort of governance structure project formation activities for for projects uh, and we also have a product team uh, that's been focused on building products to help grow and maintain open source projects uh, within the linux foundation one of those products is our insights tool uh, which is heavily leveraging the cube and cube cloud uh, stack for developer insights and, and metrics so um you know, th this tool is using public facing uh, data from, from projects to be able to kind of aggregate and collect that data. Uh, and then using Cube as that layer to avail that data in real time uh, to the public uh, through this application. So uh, Cube lets us do things like pull from these multiple data sources, like we're talking about, standardize the process of uh, visualizing that data and also giving us the ability to sort of cache through cube store and some of the the caching uh logic that's built into cube cloud already uh, to be able to allow for custom time ranges uh, of this data so you could quickly as a developer or maybe a uh someone interested in a project be able to see like when development activity is most uh active or be able to drill down into specific date ranges and and slice and dice the data quickly uh, without having to wait, you know, for a backend kind of ETL job to run and 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 avail the data. It's it's there in real time uh, within this application. Cool. Let's let's dig into your data stack. I think it. I think everyone here would be interested in sort of how it was all set up, kind of um, where Cube fits, but also the other components of the data stack as well. Yeah, so we have, uh, like I mentioned, a pretty uh, large breadth and depth of, of services that we're running here at the Linux Foundation. And as a result, we have lots of different places where data lives. Uh, anything from Google Sheets to uh, kind of our, our big platform Postgres database to HubSpot um, and another tool, Crowd.dev, which is uh, now part of the Linux Foundation uh, re recent acquisition. Uh, pulling all of this data, we're using Fivetran to essentially grab data and push this through dbt models into Snowflake, and then from Snowflake reading back into Q uh, to kind of predefine the aggregations and pre-aggregations uh, within Q to be able to avail this to our various platforms. Insights I already touched on, but also also our individual dashboards, our project control center, and organization dashboards all are leveraging Cube. Uh, to kind of visualize in real time data from all of these different data sources that we have. Um, 
with our kind of data lake or data, data cloud uh, stack that we've been building out over the last year. So uh, yeah, I could go into a lot more detail about how this is uh, structured right now. Um, a lot of the project data is flowing through crowd.dev and that's doing sort of the affiliations, which are ex extremely important to our uh, our tooling to be able to affiliate, a, you know, this email address or this this GitHub right. username or this, uh, this first and last name, uh, we can affiliate that with different data uh, and that's happening in the crowd.dev. Uh, stack there. And then once that data has been affiliated, uh, we're using Fivetran to boot the data and then DBT and Snowflake to sort of standardize the, the models and actually integrating Cube with these DBT models. Uh, there's there's good documentation within the Cube stack and, and how to do that. So we're we're leveraging that. So DBT kind of acts as this, this layer that we have in, in front of Cube. And then we're using Q to, you know, reference that data and avail it uh, however we want to slice and dice it into these different applications uh, on the front end. And these are all public uh, applications it, to some extent. The Project Control Center and organization dashboards are not, they're somewhat private, you know, depending on your, your access within a project or organization. Uh, but these are all public, you know, not not internal kind of back office tools. We're, we're using these. Uh, you know, open to the public in the real world, particularly insights and individual dashboard. Got it. So any anyone listening to this webinar could go and see it in action. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, openprofile.dev for the individual dashboard and insights.lfx.dev uh, for the insights tool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So one of the things about Cube that uh, we always talk about the, you know, from a feature standpoint, the four pillars of Cube, one of the pillars of Cube is a variety of APIs to be able to send data to different uh, applications or different uh, BI tools or whatnot. Which of the APIs are you using? Is it the, the REST API? Yes, we are heavily reliant on the REST API. Uh, we have a mm -hmm. microservices architecture uh, that runs all of the the various components here. So you know we're able to kind of plug in through our our uh, kind of ACS control access control uh, solution and integrate that in with the Q REST API to uh, pull the models out of Q. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, we also have a, a GraphQL and um, what we call the SQL API. Um, but not, you know, like as makes sense, you use the one that you need or multiple ones that you need, but, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. It, and, and actually, you know, GraphQL has been on the table. There, there may be some places where GraphQL makes more sense than the REST API for us, but the, that's kind of under, uh, discovery right now, but it's nice to mm -hmm. have the options for that. Uh, the SQL API we used, uh, very early on, we were just playing around with cube and, and trying to understand how to, how to build things. Um, yeah. And, and what we could leverage there, but we, you know, kind of standardized on the REST API with, uh, you know, GraphQL potentially in the future. Awesome. That makes sense. Yeah. Most of the customers that use the SQL API are delivering data to uh, like a Tableau or yep. um, ClickSense or, you know, a typical BI tool. Uh, and you guys are really uh, doing some interesting stuff with, you know, building your own uh, analytical experiences for people the public in this case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. And, and we may we may come back to this chart. I, I was going to ask one of the other pillars of Cube that we talk about is our caching layer where we pre-aggregate uh, some of the data. And obviously the, the point of that is to make things faster. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys are using uh, pre-aggregations or you're using that cache layer. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're doing that? Yeah, that's actually a really good, a uh, story from the Cube side. So we, you know, we're leveraging Cube Cloud mostly because we didn't have the, you know, we don't have expertise in in running and hosting the Cube software ourselves. So we, you know, we could figure it out, uh, but you know, there's a lot of operational overhead there. And one of the reasons that we wanted to go with the Cube Cloud route was to get the additional kind of support on how to best uh, structure our data with with Cube, how to how to make the data fast and and, and accessible. And the Cube team has been uh, super hands-on with us working through how we only utilize pre-aggregated data. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of our, basically our application would not be able to function without the use of pre-aggregations. And we've worked closely with the Q team to uh, ensure that we're using pre-aggregations and using them correctly. Uh, and as a result, 
that that's enabled us uh, to pre-aggregate everything and trigger pre-aggregations based on you know, the, the right metrics to kind of rebuild the pre-aggregation or re refresh the pre-aggregation. Uh, and as a result, we're able to keep, you know, a, an up-to-date cache, which can then be well, layers of caching here, but the, the cube store and pre-aggregations that we have in place from cube have helped basically make our application real time and not have to rely on, you know, kind of slow or stale data. We can kind of continuously refresh and, and use that cache to uh, load up pages and, and, and the front end kind of visualizations of data uh, using cube store. Awesome. All right. Well, we might come back to this diagram because I always think it's helpful to understand how the data flows through your system. Um, but our next, you know, kind of digging in is our fireside chat. So we can, you know, definitely take the, I've seen some questions already. Uh, so I'm collecting them, I promise. Um, and I will jump in. Uh, but let's start with, you know, can you share with us your journey? So before Cube, before kind of as you were building insights, uh, my understanding when we spoke about this a while ago was you did have insights running before Cube and um, Cube was a, a somewhat recent addition uh, to your stack. Tell, tell, tell us about the journey and how you got here. Yeah, so I want to say it was about six, five or six years ago, the first uh, Insights version uh, was released. And it was, yeah, more of a proof of concept of a tool uh, based on Elastic.co and kind of Kibana dashboards and things. And it worked. It it, it it worked. It was able to, you know, connect to data sources and, and aggregate that data and visualize it. But it was extremely expensive. Um, mm. and, and running that and computing, uh, you know, the Elastic that go stuff publicly like uh, on a each request cost you know i don't even want to say the number <laughs> amount of dollars <laughs> uh, to process it was very fast but it was it was also very expensive and so you know we we looked at ways of optimizing that and then uh, we had an internal initiative to move to a more standard kind of data lake architecture uh, to get our data at the linux foundation flowing you know into the same the same place and of course you know we were the linux foundation we we tinker we kind of you know put together kind of a science experiment of a data lake and that also ended up being very expensive and, and slow and we made our way to our current architecture which included uh some new off-the-shelf tools like uh, uh dbt snowflake and fivetran as well as cube cloud uh to kind of manage the the visualization of that data as, as we move in. So we went from kind of like home, homegrown thing A to homegrown thing B to, okay, we need to take a step back. And, and I see some comments in the Q&A here. Like we, we I need know, to I'm going to read them to you. <laughs> yeah, we need to better govern the data and and ensure that the data that we have is, is accurate and the data that we're using is, va you know, is, is valid, that it's, that it, can be represented that it's following the standards that we put in place and snowflake was a big part of that dbt was a big part of that uh we yeah. partnered with the uh, firm mammoth growth to help build out our data governance uh platform for all of this data and then uh leveraging cube on top of that has been uh pretty yeah. instrumental in making the insights the current insights platform uh performant and accurate and Perfect. just you know kind of the go-to for for our insights tool Awesome. Awesome. So, so look, we got some Q and A. So I'm going to uh, read a couple questions that I think are sort of in line with what we're talking about. Uh, this one is to be able to compare and gauge the temporality to develop a first cube. What is your data volumetry and the biggest complexities you have had to resolve? So I think that's Let's asking see, that's a, about how yeah. you got started <laughs> and how yeah, fast did, and it, uh, did it take? I can say um, it, it was very quick to get started. I think our our dev team was very excited to just jump in and, and start using Cube. I think where things got a little bit hung up was as soon as the data became a little bit more complex. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where uh, the, the the Cube team, uh, the the success team at Cube was able to come in and help us better uh, instrument our cubes and structure. You know how we do the pre aggregations, how the refresh keys work, how um, 
how to how to build that. But I'd say just in general, building a cube is is pretty straightforward if you're familiar with any sort of SQL uh, language skills. Um, you you can build a cube relatively quickly, and it gets harder, you know, as as you're building out more complex um, cubes and things. But it's really not a. It's definitely easier to do than what I've seen from our like materialized views that we were building out in Postgres directly uh, or in Redshift previously. Uh, I, I think the, the cube language and building and managing cubes is, is much simpler than that. Yep. Yeah. And uh, along the same lines, um, for the cube solutions, what is the technical language to build and pre-aggregate the cube? That's I know almost from more, of a, a, more of a question for you. For yeah, you. I was going to uh, say, uh, you had the, the choice language, of, uh, yeah. from a data model perspective, you have the choice of working with Python or um, uh, JavaScript. So there, it really depends on how, you know, when you're building your data model, what kind of language you want to build. And we found early, early days cube, um, when people are embedding cube into a product, they tend to pre uh, prefer JavaScript. Uh, so the software engineers and the product managers tend to prefer that. As more and more data engineers started using Cube, we found that Python was kind of the lingua franca, the la language of choice. Um, so uh, the way Cube works now is that you can use any of those languages. You can have multiple people on your team using different languages and they all kind of translate to uh, to building the cube data model as one. So I think that that's based, I mean, I, I don't actually know, um, what your preference is, Rudy. I mean, when you, when you built the cube, what, what did your team and like you? Yeah, I believe, <laughs> I believe they're all using like a TypeScript style, uh, yeah. uh, load for these. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. So I think our next question is, uh, just sort of pain points you're facing. You've you've dug into them a little bit, but I think we can, I think um, one of the things when we were chatting uh, a couple months ago, uh, you showed me the speed of the previous version. <laughs> so yeah, we can talk a yeah. little bit about that and sort of the importance of um, that experience. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it like I said, it's been many years of, of building an insights tool and kind of what what is the insights tool? The, these kind of like, Kind of more philosophical questions around and what what it is, and we're kind of starting to understand a little bit better as we go here. But I'd say, like I mentioned, the first insights was fast but very expensive to run. The second insights was expensive and slow because we didn't quite <laughs> know what we were doing. And the third one, we've kind of learned from these mistakes and and you know put in the the data governance model and this other this other stuff. But moving to that was difficult because we had initially started with a kind of crowd.dev only data and it was being read out of a Postgres database and, and we were trying to leverage kind of cube on top of that. And working with the cube team, we we decided that it would be better if we had the data <clears throat> basically built, <clears throat> excuse me, built out of Snowflake and the DBT models that we have there. So we, you know, we're, we were able to actually, you know, start directly against the Postgres uh, data source and then move very quickly um, using TBT and and Snowflake to that back end of a lot of our data sources. And as a result, we were able to reach, uh, you know, faster pre-aggregation build times and uh, faster data transfer speeds between S3 and and the cube cloud and and kind of um, soften the the pain <laughs> of, of yeah. that uh, the, the amount of data that we're they're dealing with. Um, so I think, you know, in general, the, the performance part has been hard uh, and also the data, you know, the, is the data accurate question has always been a, a tough one. And that's, that's more just with the, the general data governance uh, that we have here. I see a question here about, I know there's two about data questions governance. about data governance. Um, so, so let's go deeper into that. Yeah. 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 And I, I can say I, I'm definitely not the like data governance expert. Uh, we brought in uh, Mammoth Growth, who are a, a external vendor that that uh, came in to help us kind of how we, how we manage that. And we've, we've built out, you know, through their guidance, uh, a set of sort of DBT models of bronze, uh, silver, gold, and, and platinum. 
um, platinum models are are expected to be used, you know, just to visualize data. They're they're already like pre built and good. And the gold models are where we're we're sort of leveraging all of the the cube cloud stack. So the gold models aren't fully you know computed, uh, but they're in a state within Snowflake and DBT that are that are good for uh, something like cube to plug into and visualize data uh, that we're trying to get out of the the data warehouse. Got it, got it. And that kind of answers, um, is there a specific data governance platform that you guys are using? That was another question. And I am not I sure. Don't have a good, I don't have a good answer to that one, sorry. Yeah. No, no worries, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's, this next question is less interesting, so I'm gonna skip it. Um, yeah, blah, blah, blah. What is the impact of a semantic layer? So I think we can dig into that. And then uh, we do have a question about going into the components of the semantic layer. And I can jump back to one of my slides earlier and dig into that. But maybe if you want to start kind of your your thoughts on just generally the semantic layer and kind of the importance of it, the impact of it, uh, and then I can dig into some of the components and features. Sure. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the impact of the semantic layer was our ability to kind of rapidly develop, uh, you know, visualization of data to our different platforms. So we we're able to standardize on cube across multiple uh, applications that we're building uh, at the Linux Foundation. And as a result, you know, have the same uh, access to kind of the data cloud backend that we have. Uh, we can reuse the cube uh, models that we've developed for other applications uh, across these different stacks and uh you know the semantic layer lets us do custom custom time frames across this data as well so it's you know more value to our end, end users whatever they're trying to kind of glean from the data that we're providing they're able to drill down and and, and see you know different slices and dices kind of the, the cube of the data uh, rather than just kind of a preset uh, window of time uh, that they're looking at so I'd say, yeah. you know, the impact, you know, faster time to uh, like feature development for us and also the ability to, uh, you know, give more access to data uh, to our end users. Nice. Okay. So let me jump to this slide. Um, so there was a question, can you elaborate on the semantic layer? What are its components? So I can, mm -hmm. I can do it looking at this a little bit. Uh, so the way we think about it at Cube is kind of four core functions that uh, the the semantic layer really provides. the The first is what you know we've talked a bit about, but it seems fairly obvious. It's that data modeling layer. So it's that creating the single source of truth, um, and you know being able to build that and connect into you know the data sources you have, um, whether it's Snowflake or multiple data sources. Um, then we also have that centralized security uh, access control. So that is another component of what we think is, is critical to a semantic layer is being able to manage all of the uh, data access from you know, all the visualization tools, all of the data sources, so that when an individual interacts with data, that you know, at the very granular level, you know that they are allowed to to see that particular piece of data. Uh, then there's the caching layer, um, which Linux used, uh, Linux Foundation used quite a lot, which is that pre-aggregation uh, functionality that essentially, um, you know, especially many customers. If you have, there are always queries that are asked many many times. Um, pre-aggregating them in the caching layer so that you're not hitting the database as often. Um, so it usually saves money off of your Snowflake or your Databricks, um, but it also, more importantly, uh, creates a much, much faster experience for your end users. Uh, and then, of course, the APIs, which we've talked a little bit about, um, REST API, GraphQL, uh, and the SQL API, those are basically the ways we connect to the variety of, of data uh, viz tools that are out there. Um, and then we have another question, which I, I can start to answer. So uh, interested no, to know more about the Gen AI functionality. So um, 
we actually have two customers that have done uh, that have we have case studies on that are on our website that have done some really interesting stuff with Gen AI and Cube. So they uh, one of them was Spine uh, was the name of the company. They serve marketers. They had already had the uh, Cube semantic layer set up, and the marketers uh, that use their product would. Uh, basically, they they had preset uh, dashboards that they had created for the marketers as sort of, um, you know, here are your campaigns, here's the data you should know about. Then they also created a dashboard builder so that their uh, customers could self-serve a little bit more. Uh, and then they decided that they wanted uh, to create Spine AI, which is using natural language questions to uh, basically ask questions of the database. So a marketer could say, uh, over the last 12 months, um, what are the top performing campaigns and in what region? Uh, and at that point, what uh, the Spine folks did is that natural language question would then return two types of results. The first would be um, what the AI decided was the appropriate chart to answer that question, but then also um, working with, uh, integrated with ChatGPT, that came up with commentary around what the marketer should be thinking of um, and additional things they might want to ask, you know, just general chat GPT uh, AI thoughts. Um, and so this, uh, the reason they actually were able to put this together and the, and the case study is, is super interesting on the website. He, um, the fellow who did it had a lot of thoughts around uh, working with ChatGPT and how having the business logic from Cube feed ChatGPT actually made the answers better because it had that additional logic and the the data model um, that really helped uh, the AI agent understand what what the data actually meant. Um, so I highly recommend read those case studies. And then we on the Cube side um, have lots of interesting stuff we're doing right now. We have um, you know, if you keep an eye out over the next, I'd say, 15, 20 days, we have some announcements coming up that are that are Gen AI focused, um, that are, you know, in the range of what, what Spine did. And then the other one, uh, which you'll see on our website, is called Quantitech. They did something similar, creating a, an, an AI chatbot to really deliver to their customers um, much more of a questioning and answering kind of experience versus having to know what dashboard, uh, what, um, you know, having to build their own chart themselves. And it, when they explore data, they could just ask, you know, just like a natural language question. Uh, so we also see this as being uh, really effective with executives and, you know, maybe one step outside of your data analysts who they want to ask questions of the data, but they may not necessarily, you know, be able to do it within, um, the structure of the of the dashboards and whatnot that that they have in front of them. Okay, so enough about that. Uh, we can jump ahead. Uh, I'm just going to jump to this slide uh, because we have a lot of questions here. Let's see. Uh, let's I, see. I saw a lot about it looked like AI and and the AI integration with yeah, with Cube. That sounds. I'm, I'm yeah. interested as well, so I'd love to hear it. Interior APIs. How? Okay, so now we're getting into the technical piece of it. Um, so the question is, in one of your slides diagrams, the AI agents chatbots will feed into your APIs how? So in the case of what Spine and Quantitech did, they actually uh, did it themselves. So they built uh, their own connection. Um, we are exploring ways to that we can provide something that's a little bit more plug and play uh, and a little bit less, uh, fig, you know, figure out your LLM and how to, how to hook up a uh, cube to that. Um, and that's going to show up in the next couple of days. So you should hear more about that soon from Q. Uh, and then another good question. Uh, let's see. We just jumped, so I lost my. Oh, yes, there were some really good questions in the beginning that were a little bit more. Uh, I don't know if you saw them, Rudy, but they're a little bit more um, discussions versus specifics uh, around what Linux did, I think. Maybe let's do one question around Linux specifically, and then we can dig into some of these interesting questions that are coming now too. Um, so looking ahead, what are your plans for further leveraging a semantic layer? 
I'm, I, I will change this to also be where are you going with uh, the insights product with the other products that you've been working on kind of what's the future uh, you know, what are you planning to deliver to your customers, you know, or to the public uh, over time and, and how are you thinking about the future and future technologies that you may want to leverage or build or, uh, or deliver? Yeah. I mean, right now, um, you know, a lot of it is around kind of getting our data, data cloud, uh, in order, I, there were some questions earlier about kind of data governance. We're, that that is really what we're using uh, the DBT for. Uh, we don't have kind of a traditional data governance platform uh, for that. So, yeah, part of it is you know expanding the scope of what Crowd.dev does. Uh, the Linux Foundation recently acquired that that open source company, and those engineers are now part of our our team here on the uh, LFX product side at the Linux Foundation. Uh, so they're going to be expanding sort of the integrations that they have to various tools, whether it's things like uh, Atlassian Cloud or GitLab or GitHub or, uh, you know, specific, uh, you know, mar marketing tools that the project might be using uh, data from events, that sort of thing. So kind of the, the gathering of data that's going to expand um, and then further leveraging the semantic layer to, to avail that data to our various platforms. So I already mentioned, you know, the, uh, project control center insights uh organization and individual dashboards uh they continue to build out um uh, you know cloud or cube cubes for uh you know those products and be able to share them across products so maybe di different time series or di different slices of data kind of pre-populated in these applications but we can continue building on top of the cube platform and the cube cloud services to uh, kind of expand rapidly. You know, Dev on the Insights team builds a key uh, that could be reused on our organization dashboard team uh, uh, components there. Uh, we could reuse that on our individual uh, uh, dashboard or, or even the project control center uh, for that. So kind of the shared um, access to data uh, for these tools. We're also looking to build out some more kind of private or, or more restricted access to data for internal teams uh, to use. And that'll be leveraging more heavily the access control layer that Cube has out of the box. So we, you know, we talked a lot about the, the caching layer that's been uh, super important to do pre-aggregations and caching uh, for our public tools. But then we also need to start restricting uh, from some of our, some of our internal projects that leverage Cube, uh, the access control there and, and be able to know that we're strict access to uh, maybe the executive director and program manager for a project and not, you know, the general community uh, for whatever, uh, you know, data they're trying to get out of their project. Maybe it has, the contains uh, potentially PII or, or other things they don't want to have right. uh, publicly accessible. You know, we, we have a way without having to develop that ourselves, uh, this control layer and cube itself to, to do that. Awesome. Are you guys, uh, we've got, we've got a lot of questions around AI. Are you guys thinking about generative AI and, and where to go with there? Are you testing anything? Uh, just we curious. Do. Yeah, I, we, we do have a, you know, I, it's a good question. I haven't looked closely, but it sounds like I should be uh, with what Cube is doing soon uh, in the coming <laughs> weeks here. But we, we have a, an ask uh, from our executive director of the Linux Foundation to leverage more AI uh, where, where yeah. it makes sense, you know, where it makes sense. And I think, uh, you know, Cube would be a great place to leverage that. So I'm, I'm interested to see kind of how that how that works and if that lines up with sort of the the ask from from our executive director at the Linux Foundation. Yeah, yeah, I, I think many of us are getting questions <laughs> about how we're leveraging it, what we're doing, do we have plans? So I think there's a lot of a lot of good um, conversations. Yeah, I mean, I can, around you know what you know, to I'm, do, what what's useful, what's yeah, yeah, and I'm, I, you know, I'm not the product owner for Insights, but I can say, you know, being able to go into Insights and say, hey, I want to know how many contributors for blah blah blah, you know, just be able to talk yeah. to it, uh, just be able to yeah, talk chat to bot exactly. and and have it output a report, you know, for maybe it's, uh, you know, governing board meeting or something to be able to, you know, get some insights on a project, uh, you know, and be able to leverage that through Cube would be really exciting. So I think something like that could be in the future on the AI side, but we haven't really done like a deep dive on it yet and, and how we leverage that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and we uh, we got a question uh, for the data strategy level. Could you tell if you are already planning to align the AI Act from European Union? Uh, so I can say, 
for sure that I don't know what the AI Act from the European Union is, um, but I'm pretty sure it will have to do with actual the data. And one of the things to know about Cube is that um, we are not the LLM. We're not, uh, we do store a little bit of data, but only if you pre-aggregate it. Uh, so, so we're kind of a flow through system. So I'm uh, from a, an experience and from a um, compliance standpoint, we obviously work very hard to make sure that we're meeting all of the, the very, you know, SOC 2 compliance and GDPR and HIPAA and, you know, all of the different things that we can do uh, in order to make the product more secure and make our process more secure. Um, and then obviously as these, as new regulations come out, we will definitely be looking at them. Um, but since we do not own the, uh, the data, um, some of those things, um, it's more about, you know, the LLM you're using, whether it's Anthropic or OpenAI or, you know, that what the company who is using Cube chooses um, will need to probably apply is my guess. Um, but obviously that's something we're gonna continue to think about and, and do over time. Um, Okay, so yeah, and uh, actually, we... to to kind of shameless plug on top of that, you know, yes. the Linux Foundation is is on kind of the forefront of a lot of the AI and open sourcing AI models. There you um, go. <laughs> the PyTorch PyTorch Foundation is is part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, they joined us a, a couple of years ago. You know, it's a pretty well known, uh, you know, the Llama three uh, LLM, yep. uh, as well as you know, recently Snowflake and Databricks also open source their their LLM. So yeah, you know, the Linux Foundation as as an organization is helping foster kind of opening the the LLMs uh, from these big vendors. We're also you know we have a data privacy officer and a program um, you know at, at the Linux Foundation to help you know share and and follow follow law, but also to help you just share uh, code in general to kind of decentralize the the control of 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 software uh, wherever we can. So AI is a big uh, moving fast uh but we're seeing more and more <laughs> open sourcing of of uh the yeah. ai models and and i think you know the linux foundation is, is doing everything they can to help foster that yeah makes sense okay so uh we have you know seven eight more minutes um and i thought i'd go back to one one of the first questions that came up was uh was more of a a thinker um and it was from, uh, I just wonder if the single version of truth is still a valid statement as we understand better what data really is with a human dimension. Uh, and so I've, I read that uh, about 20 minutes ago and I'm still thinking about it. Um, I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. I mean, my, my thought at the end of the day is um, I've been in the data space for a long, long time and I think, and this is probably true even more broadly of technology, there is always the goal, like the the dream or, you know, what we want to get to. And I think one of the things uh, we used to talk a lot about is like the, um, that, you know, that, that one BI tool that everyone in the company will use because it will be so awesome and meet all the needs. And I think we're at a stage in our industry where, yeah, you know, there's just, it's never going to be one. There's never going to be one viz tool that everyone agrees on. Now on this single source of truth, uh, so I was at Looker for many, many years, um, and it was a similar kind of conversation is that the belief and was single source of truth was the way, you know, that we all needed to get there. Uh, and when you start working, uh, when you start selling to like Fortune 500, just enormous enterprises, you realize well, they have six BI tools and, you know, they're, they're doing so many different things and there's so many different departments and different silos of data. Can we get to a real single source of truth um, for reals? And I think at the largest enterprise, it's still going to be a goal and it's still going to be like our great desire to get there. But I think it's accurate to say it is you know, at, at the largest enterprise level, it's it's likely not going to happen perfectly, but we can do better <laughs> than we've done before. We can make steps in the right direction. Um, and one of the things about Cube, which I think is is so lovely, is that um, that agnostic uh, piece of 
you know, Looker got bought by Google. So it's kind of connected to Google BigQuery now, right? So they care a little bit about where your data comes from. Um, in our case, we are agnostic. We don't care where your data comes from. We work with all of the cloud data warehouses. We could work with multiple cloud data warehouses. Um, and in the case of the visualizations, we don't care how you want your data. We just want to deliver it and make it correct and accurate. Um, so anyway, those are my thoughts on that. I don't know if you have thoughts on this, Rudy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, no, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, more of a philosophical question almost. Yeah. But I, I think... <laughs> I mean, to me, the single version of truth is is kind of that goalpost, and we're always working toward it. And the approach we've taken at the Linux Foundation with these products is, you know, we're an open community. If you see data that you don't think is accurate, or you have additional data that we need to, uh, you know, add to our our warehouse, so we can be more accurate to tell us. And uh, we've kind of worked through that for a number of. Hey, this look this doesn't look right, or that doesn't look right. Hey, you know, this data source over here isn't being brought in and we've we've taken that feedback and, and tried to get closer to a single source of truth. Uh, but we know I think you know realistically we're we're going to keep having to work toward that. Uh, you know data data's moot for us, you know uh, 10 years ago we were we were using Garrett and and Cgit for development. You know now now almost everyone is in GitHub or GitLab. Uh, where that data comes from has been is constantly moving. And you know, it's going to be new targets. So we're, we're just trying to keep up and, uh, you know, trying to try to get our communities to help us keep up with that because it's in, it's in everybody's best interest that the data is as accurate as, as it can be. So that's yeah. sort of the approach we've taken to that, uh, that, that issue. And I think, you know, for us, it's just kind of, you're working toward that goal of us, but you know, it may, it, it may never, we never, we may never get there just because of the way uh, things yeah. are changing, but I, I feel like we're, we're inching closer Close. and closer. Yeah. <laughs> closer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and then a couple more questions just to, in our last few minutes, just to make sure that I uh, hit them. I think there was a question about uh, how um, we work with Databricks. Uh, and so from a queue perspective, um, we actually connect directly to Databricks. So we don't, that doesn't go through the, the APIs. The APIs are for the visualization layer. So if you were to see a demo of cube, um, the very beginning of the demo is, okay, now we're going to connect to your data sources. So you uh, input your credentials, log in, and they're able to, um, and then in cube, uh, basically the uh, cube guesses, gives gives a good, pretty good guess on um, what the structure of the database is. And then you can add on to that and start building your, your data model from there. So it's, it's, I don't want to say it's simple, but it is definitely easy uh, to get started. And, and then, as Rudy said, the the more complex your data, the more complex your your model, uh, and and what you're trying to do, it takes a, a little bit more uh, work to get it done. But it is um, definitely worth the effort in the end. Uh, and I think uh, one final question we didn't quite hit, and we have like one minute, so I'll just hit it. So any comment or example on the semantic interoperability using your product solutions across different industry standard taxonomies? So again, from a cube perspective, um, we can do anything and work in any industry because there's no, you know, we are reading the data as it comes from your data source. And then the model is something that you as uh, the person, you know, as the data engineer are creating. So whatever your uh, different industry standard taxonomy, you know, whatever, however you phrase things, it's all to be built uh, and can be built in that way. So we, we serve many different industries from, um, you know, kind of e-commerce to uh, very large manufacturing companies that are looking at warehouse data or IoT. Uh, we have healthcare companies. Um, so we really sort of run the gamut across, you know, many, many different industries. I think we do have a, a customer stories page. It doesn't always represent, you know, the breadth of, of customers that we actually have. Of course, we try very hard. Our marketing team tries really hard to, to write as many of these case studies as we can um, to get that kind of information uh, for everyone who's interested. 
Um, and with that, I think we have these uh, final couple resources um, in case you wanted to learn more or uh, or whatnot. And I think it is time for me to turn it back over uh, for kind of wrap up as we are at the 55. Well, uh, Jen and Rudy, this has been an amazing webinar. Thank you so much for sharing uh, the journey through building this amazing stack. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We love the questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day uh, to Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to Q for sponsoring today's webinar. And I'm so excited you got to meet our community today. Thank you, Rudy and Jen. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everyone. This was really fun. Thanks for all the questions. Yeah, thank, thank you all. Great questions. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.